Today we're meeting with Dwayne Ostrich. Hey, Strike. Ostreich. <laughs> Gotta say like an Austrian. That's right. Dwayne Ostreich. And we are gonna talk about his reef tank for a few minutes because his reef is gorgeous. And one of the things I appreciate most about it is that he goes in there and he guts it. And then a few months later, you can't even tell he gutted it and it looks amazing again. So when you guys watch this video, you're, I hope you're gonna be blown away because it's phenomenal. And when you're looking at it in person, it's of course gonna be 10 times better than what I can film. But at the same time, this was a great opportunity while I was here in Seattle for the ReefWorks Expo to talk with Dwayne specifically about his methods, his mindset, and what he does best, which is reef keeping. Dwayne, my first question to you is going to be, how on earth are you making these beautiful reefs happen? I am one of the better reef keepers in the Seattle area with a reputation that is probably better than I deserve because I make as many mistakes as the next person. Um, just a little more observant and know how to deal with them a little bit without reacting and causing problems. So my tank is a 210 gallon custom aquarium with a ghost overflow on the one end as a peninsula built into my house the back side of the peninsula is my laundry room um, again custom it's it's custom but it's a standard dimensions it's six foot long 24 inches front to back and 29 inches tall uh, it's been built into the wall since i think 2007. i started with a little 120 gallon back in 05 and Love the tank. I, I considered going a little bit larger, which would have put me into a price bracket for, for the extra 40 gallons. Just wasn't worth the time and money to remodel the house again and gain four more inches front to back. Um, so I stuck with the standard dimensions I've had for, for 12 years now. The support system is a 150 gallon sump with a, used to be a refugium, is now an LPS holding and growing system, Bubble King skimmer, I use ozone a couple hours a day, I have a Geo 16, 618 calcium reactor that, believe it or not, is 12 years old, um, real old, I mean the original pump on it too, I always look at it and go, my goodness, I really need to, it's time to upgrade that pump before it fails me when I'm on vacation is what's going to happen. Apparently you have to have the best light fixture on the planet. So what exactly is over your SPS reef? The lighting on my tank is simple eBay black boxes. What? I have been using them for five years. Um, after upgrading from a do-it-yourself LED, I built my first, I built two LEDs before I started using the eBay black boxes. So I have a pretty good understanding of the spectrum needing to grow corals. Um, I've upgraded from halide or downgraded, however you want to look at it, and created a hybrid system with some of my old do-it-yourself LEDs with the black boxes. Uh, every two years, I actually solder new emitters into my black boxes to keep them refreshed because I don't care what anyone says, LEDs age, they do degrade. I run mine at 100% because I'm an SPS freak. I'm a light and flow junkie, so I run my lights at a high percentage, and they wear out faster because of that. I've never measured the par. I have no idea what my corals run at. With LEDs and probably running ozone along with it to keep my water clear, I can grow SPS all the way at the bottom of a 30-inch deep tank, which... I probably could have done with ha halides. I never tried it because I wasn't as experienced as I am now. I've, a lot of the corals I have, I've had for near 10 years, 12 years. And a lot of the corals I have have been in the hobby for 15 and 20 years. I don't chase the latest, greatest names anymore. I buy a coral because it's pretty or because I want a purple coral that goes between the blue and the green one. I find that chasing the latest greatest name just cost me a lot of money and frustrations i get corals that i find are healthy 
and make me happy and ultimately they all look good when they're the size of a softball or a volleyball and when you're looking at them from across the room as you're watching TV or reading a book, whatever you're doing. So my fastest growing coral is a Montipora, of course. Of course it breaks the fastest. My tangs <laughs> frag it all the time. My slowest growing coral at this point is an Oregon tort, which was given to me. We named it Lucky because it was the size of a, a pea pod. And I didn't expect it would even survive the trip home from southern, um, the Tacoma area, a couple hours away. And the Oregon torts are so finicky, I just joked. And the guy who gave it to me says, well, we're going to name it Lucky. If it makes it home, you're going you're gonna to be super happy you have it. And, and a year later, I think it's about as size of a quarter. So it's growing. How do you fit all your filtration under the tank? There seems like there's so little room in that room. So earlier I had mentioned a uh, washer and my tank is built into my laundry room. When I started out into the hobby, I, when I, the 120 was built into the room, I had a small little Eschips 30 gallon sump and I built my 30 gallon refugium. That's, a, that's another story in itself. When I was building it, it leaked in my apartment and I came home to a flood. The f downstairs was flooded. They were not happy. <laughs> <laughs> so when I upgraded to the 210, I decided to go with closed loop pumps because I wasn't happy with power heads back in 2005 and 6. So I had this closed loop pump. It was so loud. I eventually just drilled a hole through the exterior of my house and I put this large sequence barracuda out on the back porch. It sat on the concrete. And after six months, I decided this is a great spot for this pump. Why don't I just build an addition on my house and put all my equipment out here? Little did I know, it was not only making my maintenance easier, my tank is dead silent now. And my wife is so happy because of that. I'm happy because of that. When I'm watching TV in the morning, I get to enjoy my reef tank and I don't have all the side effects of the skimmer, return pumps, um, the ozone generator when it comes on is pretty rattly and noisy because I'm too lazy to repair it. Having a quiet tank, also has its pitfalls because and it's so quiet, it's easy to obsess over little things. I have a, a bean animal style overflow on it. And if I don't have it tuned perfect, it's all like, oh my God, it feels like, sounds like a flushing toilet or the sink's running. That's really minimal. Um, pumps make noise. Having a fish tank is going to make noise. Um, Mark, is, as you mentioned to me the first time you saw my tank, oh my God, it's so quiet, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. There's a peace of mind in knowing that that humming along, everything is running normally. Um, I don't have that effect. I count on my apex mm -hmm. to notify me when I make mistakes or if something has gone wrong. How automated is your tank? Is there a certain controller you might like? Absolutely. I have been a Neptune user since I started in the hobby. I started out with an Aqua Controller Junior. Um, really learned the benefits of that. It was an amazing little unit, eight outlets that can control my heaters. And back then with the metal halides, it was a fail safe in case the summer months it got too hot, would shut your lights down. Moved up to an AC3, second generation for me. Eventually the Neptune, and then last summer I switched over to the Neptune 2016. It's a really elaborate system on my tank. I have 48 outlets, 12 VDM ports. I have Terrence Fugazi was teasing me. I have 12 IO ports. I use float switches. I have a magnet switch to turn lights on and off. I use feed modes. I have another switch that I can turn my pumps off when I'm doing photography which I've been taught, it just helps take great macro pictures if you can turn the flow off or at least turn it down. My, I couldn't have this system without my Apex. Um, it keeps me from making mistakes. I have alarms that tell me when I forgot to turn something on. I have alarms that tell me when the temperature is too hot or too cold. It's a great system. I would recommend it to anybody that wants to stay in the hobby for a long time. I recommend it to anybody that travels, especially for traveling. 
My Apex emails me every day at 4.30 just to let me know that the email is working. <laughs> Talk to us about dip and quarantine. Does that matter to you? Do you worry about reef pests? As far as quarantining and dipping, I'm not good at QTing fish. I typically throw them in. I've been lucky for 12 years, actually 30 years I've been keeping fish. I've never had gill flukes. I've dealt with ick, which is in a healthy reef system. Unless you have bully fish and you add a new one, chances are one will come in. It may get a small bout of ick and it can recover from that if it's a healthy specimen. If it's sick, it didn't ship well, it's a super finicky fish, it's gonna struggle. Um, in, in any tank, even my own, if I put a fish in and it's getting bullied, if it makes it past the first 72 hours, unfortunately, then I know it, it's gonna make it. Um, sometimes they don't, which is an unfortunate part of the hobby. As far as my coral, I dip everything. I don't have a full separate QT system because then that just, in my opinion, requires extra dosing, uh, another skimmer, more heaters. It would, my, my apex would be even more elaborate. <laughs> Would, would, would be crazy, um, but I do dip everything. Whether um, My LPS and softies get an iodine dip. Uh, my acropores all get dip. I use ME or Melifix. Um, I like Melifix, I've been using it for 10 years. I actually beat acro flatworms with it 10 years ago. I've probably had almost every pest in the book. I've had polyclad flatworms. I've had acro flatworms, um, monopora eating nudibranchs. I've had red bug over and over again. I don't worry too much about red bug anymore. I, I find that with large colonies, I think most experienced reef keepers would agree. Large colonies, they're fine. You do get a finicky frag. They can, especially a smooth skinned coral, they can put a hurt on it. It, it stunts its growth. It, it makes it hard for that frag to take off. So they, they can be a nuisance. I have a grow system, so I'm able to monitor my corals after I bring them home. I don't throw them directly into the display tank unless it's something from a friend. So typically they'll go into one of the grow systems. I can watch them. And if there's any question, I'll dip it again two or three times. Absolutely. So when I did the addition, it was specifically to put my giant closed loop pumps, return pumps out there, and refugium. It slowly evolved into what I call the grow system. I have a 35 gallon custom glass tank and an old 120 gallon acrylic tank. I cut the top off and turned it into a 90 and it runs about 70 gallons of water in that tank. Um, I have backups of everything in my display tank, and the nice thing is with that system, I have about 15 kinds of SPS that I don't have room for in my display tank. I wish I did. So it's always a choice of what's the prettiest coral that's going to go into the tank this year. <laughs> um, and I'm going to try to take a different approach. Mark has always teased me about tearing my tank down completely almost annually and I get a re-aquascape. I teased, teased him that it's like a cichlid tank to me. I just rearrange the rocks every year just to, so I can look at a different part of the reef. This year I'm going to try to take on a different approach to where I just re-landscape small parts at a time because I have large colonies and I find that re-aquascaping or even setting up a new tank, large colonies don't do well. I find that frags adapt to the new water conditions and new lighting so much better and faster. Um, they encrust easier because they're not being shadowed out and they're just a healthier coral and a healthier tank when you do it that way. So this year, as opposed to starting over with 60 mini colonies, I'm going to tackle small sections of the tank at the time as they get overgrown and they need pruning. That's, that's an unfortunate part of being successful is your corals need pruning. I don't like to, I have probably 15 or 20 corals that are growing into each other and killing each other. As long as the camera industry is perfect, I'm not gonna have a problem. But as soon as I start getting lazy in my alkalinity swings, the RTN is gonna come in with a vengeance and I'm probably, and you risk losing whole corals 
when you start having even a small amount of death. A whole coral, you come home from work, it's mysteriously dead. Um, in my case, it won't be mysteriously. It'll be because I've been neglecting them and they needed to be pruned. <laughs> the reason I would break my tank down annually was I had three large fish. I had a sail fan, naso, and a fox face that were all eight or nine inches. And they become pets, so I want them to be happy. And every year, the corals would grow so big that my fish, I would see the aggression. They would start getting stressed, and I wouldn't have ick because of it. But you get to know your behaviors of your pets. So at the end of every year, they would start showing signs. And I'd have to cut my corals back to make room for these three fish. So instead of taking a small section, my idea was just to spend 12 hours strip the tank down, make a bare rock, and start over with mini colonies, and then my fish could be happy for another six or eight months. When I upgraded last year, I got rid of two of the three large fish. I should have got rid of the third fish as well. It's, they become your pets. I wanted to hang on to him. Honestly, he's too big for my tank. An eight-inch naso tang is bored in a six-foot-long 200 gallon tank that's again one year later full of coral <laughs> so next time probably be next year or two years from now i will strip the tank back down and i will find the fish a better home it needs to be in a four or five hundred gallon tank possibly even a fish only with other tangs so my corals are all growing into each other and touching each other some of them are actually grafting and fusing together, which now I'm realizing are actually the same species of corals. They may have a tiny bit different coralite or growth pattern, but I believe they're probably the same coral because they're fusing and grafting like a Montipora would. Um, since my tank is so full, I, I tend to keep Seriotoporas together or I'll keep Styloporas, Posiloporas. Those are easy ones to identify. Some of my larger tortuosas are growing into milliporas. Um, typically one always wins, but with good chemistry I'm finding that they're not having these large death boundaries where they're literally touching each other and there might be a millimeter, a half a millimeter at best that they're not dying back, they're just not trying to grow in and compete with each other. They've come to almost a truce in that area. When I upgraded from the 120 to the 210, I realized that a, I like a 24 inch tank, but I wanted a taller tank that give the tank a little bit more interest and more swim room for the fish. I would, I would enjoy a bigger tank. I could have, uh, I would, I like six foot when I upgraded from four foot to six foot, I realized two more feet is a lot of real estate to take care of. If I were able to go 30 or 36 inches front to back, I would do that, but I can't because it's built into my house and then I would be sacrificing laundry room. Mm -hmm. I have to do my laundry. <laughs> if I bought a larger house, maybe then I'll consider it. So when I set the tank up last time, it was an upgrade. I had a standard tank with overflows in the back. So even with viewable on the back of the laundry room, I still stacked all the rocks against the back. And that gave me a huge slope to aquascape everything from the front. This time I set it up as a peninsula because I didn't have the overflows on the back. I like it, but it has its challenges too because now I have two straight up and down walls that I'm trying to plant corals on and light and get lighting to, especially with SPS dominant. I can't necessarily have a lot of tables in there, so I've gone with more staghorns, um, just more of a, I wouldn't, I guess you'd call them a ball shaped SPS. A lot more LP, SPS and LPS because I have nooks and crannies and shadows I can shove them into. So in 12 years now, I'm finding I'm seeking out LPS for my tank to fill some voids. I, I have, I love this look. It was, when I aquascaped my tank this time, is the first time in 30 years 
I put rock into a tank without water and it was amazingly easy. <laughs> and it gave me the option to take my time and just pull rocks back out because I wasn't soaking my carpet and having to dry my hands every 30 seconds. I wasn't working in a murky cloud with silhouette and just kind of hoping for the best. You wait two hours for the water to clear up and, and you kind of sit back and go, oh boy, I need to move these three rocks. And you start all over again making a murky cloud. If you're setting up a new tank and have an option to use dry rock or even live rock and you feel like you can get enough water in it before you cause a major spike in nutrients or, or die off of your live rock, I would recommend it. This tank was all live rock. Um, there are a few pieces of real reef, table rock. I love real reef. I think it's a great product. On the back wall, I have a couple floating rocks, per se, that are all the powerhead magnets. And I started using them about seven years ago just to add some more character, mostly real estate, because we always need more real estate in our fish tank. So I just take a huge wad of super glue to an old magnet and find a small appropriately sized rock that I know once the coral grows on isn't going to be too heavy and just pull right off the back wall. And it gives the tank a little bit more character and depth from every angle. Since I'm an SPS keeper, I like high turnover. I've always been a big flow junkie with the big closed loop pumps, a lot of power heads, a lot of light. I have three Neptune waves and a Jebo PP20 that I finally, I've dialed the PP20 back. I find it's too much flow, even for SPS. It's, it's more than I need, kind of a waste of electricity at that point. I believe the tank now has probably a 50 to 60 times turnover. Um, and I, I choke it down to probably about 35 to 40 at night so that I know that my LPS, I feed right before dark. And sometimes I do feed in the dark so that my LPS can, can get food. Um, so your tank is so healthy and I barely see any algae. Obviously you never feed it. You're one of those ultra low nutrient system guys, right? The foods I use, um, for 12 years I've been making my own food, and it's just a combination of local fish store foods, a lot of hikari and stuff that I just, I'm too lazy to decide what to feed every day, so I just throw it all in a big old pile, mix it up, and then every night the tank gets fed everything. I have pellets, New Life Spectrum, that are fed with my Apex, I believe four times a day right now, so the tank gets fed four to six times a day. A lot, I've, I've always believed in a lot of nutrients in and take a lot of nutrients right back. A, a huge reef tank requires corals need to eat. SPS corals need to eat. Um, but as much as I want to give it to them, I want to take it away right away so that I don't have cyano and hair algae. So um, great filtration, a lot of flow, a lot of food. And I do water changes. I try to do 10 to 20% a month. Sometimes I'm lazy. Sometimes I do zero a month. I would think recently I went three months without a water change. First time in 12 years I ever went so far without a water change. So it's possible. Along with the pellets and my own food, I've recently started using Rod's food. I was talking with Rod and he was explaining the differences of what I'm doing to compared to what he's able to do as a commercial seller. I'll probably start using Larry's food too, Larry's Reef Frenzy, because I think a variety of everything is more beneficial to your tank. Um, speaking of beneficial, I've, and three months ago I started using Vena Pets, Vena Reef. Um, talk with Jeremy about it, he got me hooked on it. I love it. My LPS and softies do better than they have in 12 years, especially in a, a mixed reef with high flow, low nutrient, I wouldn't say low nutrient because I feed the holy heck out of my fish tank, but they still struggle even with, with the high flow. They have a hard time grabbing food, so hence the reason why I slow down the flow at night and I turn off the flow. I've recently in the last year started turning off the flow when I feed so that it does slow the water column down. My fish, I have a lot of antheas. It's easier for them to feed 
it's definitely easier my LPS for them to extend polyps and grab food out of the water column that way. As far as my fish, I have about 31 in the display tank and another 10 in the grow systems. I keep them in the grow systems. It forces me to feed the grow systems because the corals need food. So otherwise my SPS in those two tanks would just be really starved of food. I have a few in there because I'm babysitting for some friends that one guy's tank blew out. So I'm, I hold corals for friends. Do you ever share the corals you have or are you just hoarding them all for yourself? Um, I try to pay it forward in this hobby. It's not all about making every penny back. It's, it's about helping propagate the hobby and keeping it moving forward and not stripping out of the reef so much. If you can have a coral bank with a friend, it's important. But as far as my fish, I have four or five tangs throughout the system. I have a pair of mandarin dragonettes that actually, I was lucky enough, they, they're a bonded pair and they dance every night right before bed. They do their little spawning ritual. I have two harems of antheas. I have a harem of lyre tails, uh, one male and four females. And I recently brought home a harem of Bartlett's antheas. And I ended up with one male and six females. And the females range in size from about an inch to an inch and a half. I was, it was kind of fun to, I was able to net them my local fish store. I'm such an addict and a junkie there. They usually make me beg my own corals and net my own fish nowadays because they're just tired of me being there and they want me to leave. Just go get your own fish. <laughs> I have a pair of clowns. Um, I have the fattest lawnmower blenny in the world. This thing is pot-bellied. I cannot believe it has not burst and died. Mm -hmm. It is the biggest pig. <laughs> um, other than that, there I have a couple hawkfish. What's the oldest fish in your tank? A long-nosed hawk that I believe is my oldest fish that I've had for probably six years now. It's, it, it's one of those fish that does okay in a smaller tank, so I started it in a 30. I, I took a break. I had to break the 210 down for a couple of years due to economics, but I never got out of the hobby. I was still working with the fish store, um, setting tanks up, doing tank maintenance for a friend who was unable to due to physical constraints. So I never, never got out of the hobby. And then I, I got the hawkfish because it was good in a small tank. And it's graduated back up into the 210 as I set it up. And he thinks he's the tank bully. Every time I introduce a new fish, he, he comes in and harasses it, but he can't swim long enough, so he doesn't harass very good. <laughs> he just kind of makes himself known, and, and then he gives up. So most fish just kind of are introduced and then are left alone real quickly. Um, I find that the larger my corals are, now when I introduce fish, they do so much better because they can, they can blend in with harems of antheas, and they just have that many more hiding spots. They can get down underneath of large corals and dart away. It's not just barren rock. It's, so the, the larger my corals get, the more natural the aquascape is. I have the two large staghorns, and it's amazing. My, my yellow tang will seek refuge in there from the flow. And then the antheas, when they get stressed, they all ball up in there, both harems together. So it's really neat seeing 13, 14 fish of two species schooling together, like in the wild. So, lucky. How does your family feel about your tank? My family is back and forth over my hobby. It's my addiction, it's my passion. Like I say, I've been keeping fish for 30 years. 12 years ago, I started growing coral. I figured I was old enough and responsible enough to, to take on the task of, of an elaborate system. Um, growing corals isn't something that you just throw food out every couple days. It's a commitment. It takes a lot of work. And to me, it's, it's a passion that has grown and evolved. That's why I tell people it's, it's a progressive disease. You don't start out with a 200 gallon fish tank. Um, some do, but for me, it's, it's taken 30 years to evolve into what it is. My wife loves it as long as it's not costing us a fortune. Um, I offset that with my grow system and I grow coral for the local fish store 
and they're nice enough to, we've worked out a deal where I get store credit. It's not a business for me, but I grow coral for, to help the hobby offset costs. It gets salt, I get more coral, I get fish. Um, but also, I feel like I'm doing a service for the hobby as a whole because we're taking that much less off the reefs. A lot of what I have is easily sustainable, just brood stock, easy stuff for beginners, um, grows well for me, and it's bulletproof. It's been in the hobby for 10, 12 years, and it can take alkalinity swings. It can take the bigger temperature swings and still stay pretty. That's important. Last year, I made, I ordered 700 frag plugs throughout the course of the year. It shocked me. I had no idea until I looked back at Amazon did all my orders and went, oh my God, I've made 600 frags this year. Wow. <laughs> um, pretty impressive. I don't take any frags out of the display tank. That's my living room. That is my joy. That's why I'm in the hobby. So everything in the grow system is either self-sustaining or it just disappears and I don't have that to offer to the fish store anymore. So it works well. Um, I, I recommend anyone, if you can not have a frag rack sitting in the middle of your glorious display tank. If you can take a part of your sump and put even just enough adequate light over it. So when you do have to make frags, you can have 10 or 15, 40 frags, whatever you want it to be, out of your display tank. Your display tank is called a display tank for a reason. You don't want to grow frags in your display tank. That's for you. If you can offset your costs, if you have to sell to local hobbyists for $30 here and there, that's great. That, that, like I said, you're giving back to the community and you're not taking off the reef. <laughs>